So our next speaker today is Dr. Sam Hoare. Uh, Dr. Hoare is a pharmacology data analyst and the founder of Pharmechanics LLC, a data analysis company supporting pharmaceutical life science and academic scientists in the development of new therapeutics and the understanding of receptor systems. Uh, Dr. Hoare is going to talk to us today about kinetics of target binding, impact on drug activity from bench to bedside. Uh, Sam, the floor is yours. Thanks very much. Uh, I hope everybody's having a good day today. I'd like to uh, thank Serene and the organizers for the opportunity to talk with you today about target binding kinetics. Here we're talking about time, the time it takes for the drug to recognize the target, which is the association process, and how long the drug remains bound to the target, which is governed by the dissociation process. This seminar will focus on the impact of binding kinetics on the development of new, new therapeutic molecules. We'll do this from bedside to bench. We'll talk about the impact of kinetics on drug effect in man. Then we'll go through the impact on the in vitro assays we use to quantify drug, drug effect on the target. Let's first go through an introduction on the basic concepts of binding kinetics. Here is the familiar basic binding interaction. Drug in red here binds to a target in blue. We measure the level of the drug of the target bound to the drug at various times after drug addition. What we see is the classic exponential association curve. Binding first increases rapidly in the association phase, then slows down, then finally approaches a plateau where binding is at equilibrium. Association is governed by the association rate constant, termed K on. K on can be viewed as the rate of recognition of the drug by the target. Drug can then dissociate from the target, and this is governed by the dissociation rate constant, K off. We can measure this in a dissociation experiment in which drug and target are incubated together, and then the free drug is washed out or outcompeted with an inhibitor. This gives us the classic exponential decay curve. The dissociation rate constant is of considerable interest to drug discovery. K off can be viewed as a measure of the duration of the drug target complex. This duration can govern drug activity in vivo, as we shall see. It is often termed the residence time, which is calculated as one divided by K off. The residence time varies between different drugs. Here, the residence time is 10 minutes. Here's what the data look like for a longer residence time of one hour. And here's the curve for a shorter residence time of two minutes. One final bit of theory. It turns out the binding rate constants are related to the binding affinity. Binding affinity, or KD, can be calculated as K off divided by K on. Binding kinetics has become of great interest to drug discovery. Residence time can determine the magnitude and duration of drug effect in man. Here we're talking about pharmacodynamics, and we'll go through a couple of examples. Here are review articles that provide a good introduction to the topic. Throughout this presentation, you'll see links to key papers if you want to take a deeper dive on specific topics. Please contact me or the organizers for a copy of the slide deck so you can access the links. At the bottom here are a couple of useful videos on YouTube. The first thing to note is that residence time can vary enormously. Here is a sampling of the residence time of numerous drugs in clinical use. Note this scale at the bottom here goes from one second to one week. On the short end of the scale, we have a couple of ion channel modulators here with residence times of around a second. Then we can see that the majority of drugs have residence times from around a minute to an hour. Then some compounds bind with a long residence time of many hours. And finally, some compounds form extraordinarily long-lived complexes with their targets, with residence times of several days. Some of the long residence time compounds are renowned for having unusually strong efficacy or for having a prolonged duration of action. 
That completes the introduction. Here's the outline for the rest of the presentation. Basically, we're going to be talking about the why, the how, and the when of binding kinetics in drug discovery. Why should we think about kinetics? I'll go through two reasons. First is that kinetics can impact drug effect in man and in animal models. I'll go through this briefly, showing a couple of key examples. The second reason is that kinetics affects in vitro measurements of drug potency. Much of this workshop is focused on how to get reliable data from in vitro assays. Here we're going to go through a problem that arises for long residence time compounds. It turns out that a long residence time can profoundly distort the measurement of drug potency in the in vitro activity assays we use routinely. We'll see why this happens and show how we can detect and avoid this problem. Then we'll go through the methods we use to measure the kinetics of drug binding. There are two approaches. First, we'll go through the assays that detect whether our compounds have a long residence time, since this can be a benefit or a problem. Second, we'll go through the assays to actually quantify the rates of binding. We'll finish with some thinking about when to apply kinetics in the drug discovery process, given that this takes significant resources. Let's start by looking at how kinetics can affect drug effect in man. In this example, we will see how residence time can define the duration of drug effect, compensating for rapid compound elimination from the body. This is exemplified by the drug apicopone. This is a new drug for treating Parkinson's disease. Apicopone stabilizes the levels of L-DOPA by inhibiting the enzyme that metabolizes it, catechol O-methyltransferase. Once a day dosing is the goal here. In this experiment, healthy volunteers were dosed with a single dose of apicopone. In red here is the drug concentration in the plasma over 24 hours. You can see that the drug doesn't last long. The half-life is 1.2 hours, and by 24 hours, the drug has been completely cleared. Now let's bring in the drug efficacy. Here we're looking at target engagement by measuring inhibition of activity of the target, the COM-T enzyme. In blue here is the target engagement over 24 hours after the dose. We can see clearly that engagement is sustained throughout the day here, and that the drug is effective long after the free drug has been cleared from the circulation. This experiment was extended out to six days after the dose was given, as shown here. Remarkably, the target was engaged by the drug throughout this six-day period, long after the free drug had been cleared. This is explained by a picopone having a very long residence time for COM-T. In vitro, the residence time was measured to be six days. This agrees pretty well with the PD half-life of 5.4 days. So this is a really nice example of how residence time can impact pharmacodynamics of a drug in clinical use. We also need to think about short-acting drugs. Sometimes we want a compound to have an effect for a certain duration of time before the effect wears off. Here we're talking about sleep drugs, emergency medicines, and anesthetics. Here, a long residence time can be a problem, as you can imagine from seeing the previous slide. Let's consider a sleep drug. We want rapid onset of action for sleep initiation, then we want efficacy to persist for a certain period of time, and then we want the drug to wear off so as to minimize impairment of next day performance. The classical way to do this is to tune the elimination rate of the drug by controlling its pharmacokinetics. Here's a PKPD profile similar to that of the GABA-A modulator Ambien. In red here, we have the drug concentration with an elimination half time of two hours. In blue here, we have the target engagement for a compound with a short residence time of five minutes. Target engagement of 30% is required for efficacy of this class of drugs. We hit this threshold in a few minutes with this short residence time compound, remain above it for about five hours, after which the target engagement wears off. This timing is just right for a sleep drug. Now let's consider a, a short, a slow residence time drug, which is this dashed blue line here. Clearly things are way off. 
This compound has the same affinity as the first one, but has a much longer residence time at six hours. The first thing to notice that is the onset is very much delayed. We're not reaching threshold until three hours. This is actually anticipated. Long residence time drugs take longer to equilibrate with the target, and this has a sound basis in theory, but we'll be coming back to it later. This delay means the drug won't help with sleep onset. The second thing is that the duration goes out to seven hours, which will produce next day impairment effects. It's worth pausing here and thinking about the drug development process. Until recently, residence time was not measured very often before taking a drug into the clinic. It was implicitly assumed compounds have a short residence time and that the drug effect is defined by pharmacokinetics. The two examples as we've just seen show how a long residence time can profoundly distort pharmacodynamics, and there have been instances of this happening for unexpectedly long residence time drugs when they were taken into the clinic. It's best instead to measure the residence time of clinical candidates before advancing to expensive clinical trials. Here we've gone through a couple of examples. There are a lot of potential scenarios, and these papers here are an excellent resource for those of you who want to look into this more. If you want to run your own simulations, there is a collection of easy to use simulators available for free at this link. One thing to note is that the extent of the effect of the residence time is dependent on the relationship between the compound pharmacokinetics and the target binding kinetics. For example, when the compound resides in the body a lot longer than it resides on the target, the target residence time doesn't have much of an effect. Now we're going to turn our attention to the in vitro phase of drug discovery. Here we're talking about the target-based assays we use to quantify compound potency to establish SAR and optimize new molecules. We're going to see some scary stuff. It turns out that a long residence time can, in certain circumstances, really mess up with these assays. Specifically, a long residence time can result in dramatic underestimation of the affinity of our compounds if these assays are not incubated for long enough. Now, this is based on one of those little details that pharmacologists think about. This detail is that drug affinity is an equilibrium parameter. Affinity is the concentration of drug required to occupy 50% of the targets at equilibrium. Now, it takes time for equilibrium to be reached. When you look into the mechanics, something surprising emerges. The time it takes to reach equilibrium is dependent on the residence time. Compounds with a long residence time take a long time to reach equilibrium. For such compounds, if we don't incubate the assay for long enough, we will underestimate their affinity for the target. Let's see this in action. In this experiment, we are measuring the affinity of a compound binding to a target using a standard binding saturation assay. This is a compound with a long residence time of six hours. The affinity of this compound is one nanomolar, and the black line on the graph here shows the true affinity of the compound for the target. Now let's assume an incubation time of only 10 minutes, something we might use in a functional assay, for example. Something is clearly wrong here. The affinity is one, one nanomolar, but the midpoint here is 20 nanomolar. So this assay isn't reporting the affinity correctly. With a short incubation time, we're dramatically underestimating the affinity. Now let's increase the incubation time to one hour, something we might use in a binding assay. This assay is still not reporting the affinity correctly. The measured affinity here is four nanomolar. It turns out we have to increase the incubation time out to 12 hours for this assay to report the affinity correctly, shown by the data in red here. How long should we incubate the assay? The incubation time needs to be, needs to be at least two times as long as the residence time for assays to correctly quantify the affinity according to simulations and experiments. One obvious message from this slide is that we should avoid really short incubation times for our SAR, SAR assay. This artifact is based on the mechanics of ligand association with the target. Here is a graph showing the time course of target occupancy by the compound from the previous slide. 
This is shown for various concentrations of the compound from 100 nanomole down to 0.032 nanomole. When equilibrium is reached, the curve reaches a plateau, which is on the right-hand side here. The thing to notice here is that the time it takes equilibrium to be reached is dependent on the concentration of compound. Equilibrium for the highest concentration, 100 nanomolar in blue here, is reached within a few minutes. By contrast, for the lower concentrations, for example, 0.32 nanomolar here, it takes a lot longer. It takes 12 hours for this curve to, to reach the equilibrium plateau. It is this that distorts the binding curve we saw on the previous slide. Now, this is just a single compound. What happens when we have a range of compounds with a range of residence times? It turns out this underestimation of affinity is dependent on the residence time of the compound. Here we have binding curves for a series of compounds with a range of affinity. This graph assumes we are at equilibrium, so the experiment is faithfully reporting the affinity. In this example, we assume the affinity is determined by the residence time. The longer the residence time, the higher the affinity of the ligand. We have a compound in blue on the left here with a residence time of 48 hours and an affinity of 23 picomolar. And we have a compound on the right with a residence time of 11 minutes and an affinity of 12 nanomolar. Now this graph assumes the assay is at equilibrium. What happens now if we assume an incubation time of one hour? Here's what the data look like. What this clearly shows is that the assay is not discriminating between the high affinity compounds here. They are all bunching up around one nanomolar. At one hour, we are nowhere near equilibrium for the longer residence time compounds. Remember, we need an incubation time that is double the residence time for the assay to approach equilibrium. Now we can determine the apparent affinity or the KD from the, the midpoint of the curves as shown here. We can plot these values as a column graph and that's shown on the next slide here. On the left, we have plotted the true affinity of the compounds at equilibrium. And on the right is the affinity measured using the one hour incubation time. The 48 hour residence time compound here has a real affinity of 23 picomolar, but a measured affinity of 690 picomolar after an hour. This underestimates affinity by 30 fold. However, for the shorter residence time compound of 11 minutes, the one hour incubation reliably quantif quantifies the affinity at 12 nanomolar. When we look at the data set as a whole, we can see at one hour we hit an assay floor. The compounds all bunch up around the one nanomolar mark. This means compounds could be a lot more potent, but we would not be able to detect them using the one hour incubation. This region here represents a lot of SAR that we wouldn't be able to detect using this assay. This can do a lot of damage to drug discovery campaigns. Often the best compounds go unnoticed because we're not incubating long enough to detect their high affinity. This results in missed SAR opportunities and failure to test the best compounds in vivo. It can even impact human dosing because the compound could be a lot more potent than we think it is. This artifact happens because the residence time determines the time it takes for equilibrium to be reached. This rather surprising fact is shown on the association graphs here. On the left, we have a long residence time compound from the previous slide of six hours. On the right, we have a shorter residence time compound of 23 minutes. For the long residence time, it takes a long time to reach equilibrium. Here we have the six hour time point and we're still not at the plateau for the lower concentrations. Contrast that with the short residence time compound on the right. Here the equilibrium plateau is reached within one hour for the low concentrations of ligand. It is this surprising dependence of equilibration time on residence time that underlies the artifacts that distort the measurement of affinity if the incubation time isn't long enough. This situation arises in drug discovery. For a good example, this case study on GPCR antagonists provides a perspective on the real-world implications of affinity distortion resulting from long residence times. This study focuses particularly 
on how the distortion can produce a di disabling disconnect between in vivo efficacy results and in vitro affinity measurements, and how this can be resolved by measuring binding kinetics. Now, having gone through the benefits and liabilities, we come to the methods that can be used to evaluate binding kinetics. There is an ocean of information on this, and here are some really, re really useful reviews. There are a couple of ways to look at binding kinetics in drug discovery. First is an approach that asks, do my compounds have long residence times? This qualitative approach does not take a lot of resources. Given the potential benefits and liabilities of the long residence time, it's good to have ways of addressing this without going to too much trouble. The second approach is to measure the rates of binding using dedicated kinetics assays. These are usually feasible, but require more resources. We'll start with the first approach, detecting whether compounds have a long residence time. One simple way to do this is the so-called KI shift assay. Here's an example for a receptor, the gonadotropin releasing hormone receptor. What we have here is a simple competition ligand binding assay. Compound is competed against a tracer in a dose response format. Then this is run at two different times. A short incubation of 30 minutes here and a much longer incubation of 10 hours. If the compound has a long residence time, as shown in this graph, the dose response will shift to the left for the longer incubation. In other words, the compound will appear to be more potent. If the compound has a short residence time, as shown here, the curves for the time points will overlie one another. The data can be analyzed by calculating the Ki shift dividing the Ki of the short incubation by the Ki for the long one. Here is a plot of the Ki shift of 78 compounds in the assay. Seven of these had a ratio greater than six and were then shown to have a long residence time, in this case, 90 minutes or longer. Another quick check is the insurmountability test. This is popular for cell signaling assays and is used for antagonist compounds. Here we have an example of cyclic AMP generation by a GPCR, the receptor for corticotropin releasing factor. We do an experiment where we measure the dose response to the agonist in the presence of increasing concentrations of the antagonist compound. There's a nice diagnostic pattern that can emerge. Short residence time compounds, like the one on the left, produce a shift of the dose response curve, but they do not reduce the maximal response. These curves all plateau at the same level. By contrast, a long residence time compound behaves differently. The antagonist reduces the maximal response to the agonist. This is called insurmountability, and it can be diagnostic of a long residence time. This isn't always the case though. Allosteric modulators can also produce this insurmountable behavior. If we figure out there is a residence time issue on the target, the next stage, is to measure the binding, the binding rates K on and K off. The best way to do this is with a binding assay. In a perfect world, we would have a direct target ligand binding assay. The most widely applied direct assay is the surface plasmon resonance assay as shown on this slide. This usually requires a purified and well-behaved target. Here, all we have in the assay is the compound and the target and the binding signal is recorded as a change in the SPR intensity. We measure this over time. The first phase here is association, then we remove the compound and detect dissociation. Alternatively, we can use a tagged ligand to directly measure ligand binding to the target. These tags are either a radioactive element creating a radio ligand or, or a fluorescent label. Now we'll go through how to analyze these data to measure K on and K off. This is reasonably straightforward and can be done in familiar curve fitting software. Here I'll walk you through how to do the analysis using the popular program PRISM from GraphPad software. The basic principles are the same for all curve fitting programs. We'll start with dissociation because it's a bit simpler. Here are the time course data for compound dissociation from the target. This can be obtained by incubating compound and target together until equilibrium is reached, then washing out the free compound to initiate the dissociation phase. We open the analysis dialog, which is here, and this takes us to a list of equations. 
One of the sets relates to target binding kinetics. Now we select the relevant equation, dissociation one phase exponential decay. If you click on details here, this gives background on the fit, and here's the equation right here. Let's close this and return to the analysis dialog. We click OK here to run the analysis. And this gives us the fitted curve that you can see here, and here is the results table. K is the K-off value in this case. From this K-value, we can calculate the residence time, which is 1 divided by K-off, giving a value of 14 minutes. We're going to need the K-off the, uh, the value here in a minute. Now let's do the association analysis to measure the association rate constant. In this experiment, target and drug are combined, and the level of drug target complex measured over time. We open this in PRISM. Then we open the analysis dialog as before. The equation we want is association kinetics, one concentration of hot. In this analysis, we need to enter a couple of constants. We go to the constraint tab here. We need to enter the K off value from the previous slide. And we also need to enter the concentration of compound in nanomolar. We click OK here to run the analysis. And here are the results. The results table here shows the fitted value of K on, in this case, about three times 10 to the seven inverse molar times inverse time. The units for K on are kind of abstract, unfortunately. We have recently written a chapter for the assay guidance manual on data analysis for kinetic experiments designed to measure K on and K off. This is currently, this is currently in press and will be coming out pretty soon. Usually, we don't have the luxury of a direct binding assay, and instead we use an indirect competition type binding assay. Here, we're inhibiting the binding of a tracer compound by our unlabeled compounds of interest. This is the so called Matoski and Mayen method. Fluorescent tracers are ideal for this because the assay can be run in real time format. We put a single plate in the reader and read it repeatedly over time to determine the time course. This graph is a fluorescent tracer binding to BTK kinase, and it shows the not large number of time points we can collect with this modality. Tracer binding is measured by itself and in the presence of a range of concentrations of inhibitor test compound. What we do now is to fit these data to an equation which returns fitted values of K on and K off of our unlabeled test compound. This method allows us to measure the affinity of long residence time compounds. We can calculate the affinity, or KD, by dividing K off by K on, as we mentioned earlier. I won't go through the data analysis here today in the interest of time, but at the bottom left here are papers that go into the details. What if we don't have a binding assay? Fortunately, functional assays can be used to measure the kinetics of inhibitor compounds. All we need is an assay of the target's function, like an enzyme activity assay or a signaling, signaling assay for a receptor. This involves the washout method. Compound and target are incubated together to form the complex. Then the unbound compound is removed by a washout or jump dilution step. After this, the compound can start dissociating from the target. We then add the reagents to measure target activity like enzyme substrate or receptor agonist. When the compound dissociates from the target, activity of the protein commences that we can measure by product formation or signal generation. Here is an example for an enzyme using the jump dilution method. Here we're measuring ADP release by the protein kinase ABL1. We see the straight line time course for the control without inhibitor. In the other traces, we, the, we see the inhibitor slows down the enzyme activity, and this is because the inhibitor first has to dissociate before the enzyme activity starts. An equation is available to analyze these curves to determine the dissociation rate shown in the table here. Here's an example for a cell signaling assay. Here, the H1 histamine receptor is incubated overnight with antagonist. The antagonist is then washed away and the cells are then incubated for various times before the addition of histamine. 
The response is, measure, is measured a short time after histamine is added. In this case, we're measuring calcium signaling. On the right is the graph. Here, the y-axis is the time interval between washout of antagonist and the measurement of the histamine response. Mepiramine dissociates rapidly, so the agonist re response returns quickly. Other compounds dissociate more slowly, so it takes longer for the response to come back. The data are fit to, to, simple, to a simple exponential equation to determine the antagonist residence times shown here. Now we will conclude with the question of when to measure binding kinetics in the drug discovery cascade. As you have seen, kinetics has major implications for the quantification of drug effect, but it does take a commitment of resources to evaluate the kinetics. A reasonable trade-off is to assess the kinetics of lead compounds, for example, at the advanced lead stage when we are starting to test compounds in vivo. This can avoid surprises of in vivo activity that can result from slow dissociation. This can be extended to selected compounds from hit to lead to see if there is a residence time issue for the series. At this stage, qualitative assays can be used to test for a long residence time. This can be modified by circumstances. It may, it may be decided before a project starts that a long residence time is, necess is a necessary feature of the therapeutic mode of action and kinetic assays will be built into the project from the start. At the later stages, binding kinetics is of high potential significance and it is recommended the residence time of the compounds be measured. The worst case scenarios of residence time here are pretty bad. If the affinity has been underestimated owing to a long residence time, the target could be much more extensively occupied by the drug candidate than expected with the potential for mechanism-based toxicity. If a short duration drug is the goal, a long residence time could dramatically distort the time course of efficacy as we saw earlier. These issues could be prevented by simply measuring the residence time of the candidates earlier in the cascade. This brings us to the end of the presentation. I'd like to acknowledge some colleagues and collaborators who've provided really useful feedback and discussion over the years on the kinetics topic. And finally, I'd like to thank you all very much for your time and attention. Thank you very much, Sam, for that wonderful presentation. Um, so uh, I'm looking at the chat box now. I do not see questions so far. Um, so if anyone uh, has questions for Dr. Hoare, please, write uh, your questions in the chat box to all panelists or uh, under Q&A. So I do not see questions coming in right now, Sam, but um, uh, would you mind keep an eye on the chat box because sometimes questions come in a bit later. Sure. Uh, so uh, we will assign those questions to you as they come in. Great. Okay, thanks again. So this concludes our morning session. So thank you for all the speakers. And I would also um, uh, hope that you all enjoyed the talks. Uh, we'll take a lunch break now, uh, and then we'll reconvene at 1.30 uh, for a really exciting afternoon session uh, on emerging technologies in drug discovery. So I really hope uh, you all can join the afternoon session as well. Meanwhile, there will be run, uh, lunch tables uh, that we will be running. So if you are registered uh, to attend those lunch tables, you need to exit this event and then um, and then log into the individual roundtable uh, WebEx events. And then once the roundtables are done, you have to exit those events and log back into this current event. Uh, so uh, with this, uh, again, I would uh, thank everyone and uh, we will see you at 1.30 today.